And today we're going to talk about a partnership that, um, and some of the lessons we've learned about working between universities and archive institutions, um, <coughs> some of the handicaps, obstacles, and some of the good things. Now, for the past three years, we've been running um, a, a free evening lecture series. Um, we're now into year three, so it's lecture series three. Um, and all for the general public around the subjects of family and local history. Um, Janice, can you remind me how this happened? How this came about? <laughs> um, well, to be honest, the way it came about was is that my colleague, who works in the office with me, she's very enterprising. And when I was off on maternity leave, she noticed that Prony had closed because they were moving from their old building into a new building. And she thought, they probably have a similar demographic to us. We sh are looking to try and raise our profile in Ireland a bit. We had moved into a new building as well. And um, like I said, her and I both quite like doing external engagement and enterprising sort of things. And so she said, you know, you really should approach Prony and see if they're interested in setting up a partnership because they're just opening their new building and they're probably looking for people to come and speak to them. So that's kind of what happened really. And we set up a meeting um, and uh, we started talking. And I think Heather's ideas were maybe the OU could provide the crisps for your building opening, which wasn't really kind of, I don't think the idea that they had in mind, really. But then after, but as the meeting went on, I kind of got the idea that we had an MA in local history, um, and we were looking, obviously, to raise profile. We had that knowledge, in essence, uh, that understanding, um, but maybe we could, but we don't really have a good venue, and we don't have access to our buy-in from the local community like Prony does. And so maybe we would maybe try and do, say, something like a lecture series. And that's pretty much how it uh, came about. We didn't really have any sort of fixed ideas or agendas when we went in, but as the meeting progressed, we decided that the lecture series would probably play to each party's strengths. Like I said, Prony had a new building. They wanted to encourage visitors. I ran an MA program in local history with a number of Irish-based tutors, um, again, which was key. These, these individuals had expertise. They could probably give local lectures without having to travel too far. Um, but I didn't really have presence within the Irish local history scene very much. Okay, I mean, from Prony's perspective, we, we, we instantly realized we brought quite a bit to the table. I mean, we have pretty much most of the key primary source material for Northern Ireland. Some of the scrap is a one-stop shop. We also have the Titanic Quarter Ascent, also known as the New Building, um, which comprises a lecture theatre complete with full AV suite. Um, the building itself was and still is a curiosity to many who have not already been. Um, we appeared on Who Do You Think You Are last week, for anybody who hasn't seen it. Um, we were, and we are able to maximise that to great effect. We also have a late Thursday evening um, a slot, which enabled us to facilitate the working public. Um, we have One thing we also brought was an, our own audience, um, an adult audience, comprising <coughs> visitors, who have already signed up to a distribution list. Um, Prony itself is one part of our parent department, which is the Department of Culture, Arts and Leisure in Northern Ireland, and that meant we were able to get that buy-in from um, our parent department, so we were able to wheel out a minister um, to launch the event at a photo shoot. Yeah, that's the one. And <laughs> we was still got her. Yeah. Um, Prony has its own budget, which we were able to draw off so we're able to um, leave for all of Northern Ireland. Um, we also had access to Northern Ireland Civil Service's graphic design unit, again a free resource, who um, designed these lovely, beautiful leaflets that you see behind you. And we also had a bit of prior experience. We'd, done, we'd already started a, a, another collaboration with an institution called the Lennon Hall Library, and we were running an archive-based lecture series with them as well. But from the outset, we saw this lecture series as very much to establish a cornerstone um, for our new events program, because um, this kicked off as soon as we reopened to the public. Um, we're also aware our staff did not have the time to do the level of research that a university team would be able to do. Um, so the Open University offered us that fit that we could present, such that we could present a high quality product, which is underpinned by respected scholarship. And, um, and I think that that's kind of the theme of the talk, is what we're trying to get across, really, is, is that 
our partnership, I think, works well is because we each have something that the other guy doesn't really have, and it's hard for them to access. And so for me, really, as a historian of Irish history running an MA program, it was kind of a no-brainer to give up, get up and give a lecture. Um, so, And it wasn't really hard for me either to access other experts to provide a range of, whereas that was really quite um, difficult for Prony to do. And the other thing as well is, is that um, because the OU is a distance learning university which operates across the whole of the UK and Ireland, um, we struggle to be perceived as locally relevant or having, and particularly in Ireland as well, because most of our course materials would be international in tone. So trying to convince Irish students that there's something in this course material for them or that the OU actually has something to say about Irish history in particular is, kind of, is a priority for me. So I was really trying to boost our profile within the heritage community um, in Northern Ireland and to try and promote our MA program. Um, because in essence, we realized pretty quickly on that, and I think the elephant in the room so far has been the adult learner, right? And that archives do target, yeah, we do target, you know, you're, you're trying to reach out to undergraduate students too, right? But you've also got this adult learner market, which the OU and Prony share, and that we could both work on together to try and uh, develop um, in some way. So what we did was, in essence, to structure the lecture series around the themes which featured within our MA program. You know, so we weren't really trying to reinvent the wheel or anything. We just took the actual six themes of the MA and delivered a lecture on each one of them and then bolted on a kind of a panel discussion at the beginning. Um, and, uh, but what I wanted to do really was to, uh, to do something more than just deliver, I suppose, subject-based or contest-based lectures. Um, so we made the focus of the lectures really to be much more skills-based, how-to. So, um, uh, um, so the lectures were not just about poverty or industrialization, but how the audience could explore these themes in their own community, their own research, in their own family, um, uh, and do that for themselves using sources from Prony, using methods or ideas that I had talked about in the lecture. Yeah, I mean, it took quite a bit of brainstorming, Janice. So we have the Again, the structure right didn't come straight away. We had several meetings to agree um, timings, location, availability of sources, the role of real primary sources, social media. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I know this is slightly off script and I'm freaked out about time, um, but um, I remember that we talked for ages and ages and ages about how primary source material could be used in these lectures, right? And so I was the very pie-in-the-sky academic saying, yeah, and we'll get all these primary sources out of the archives and we'll put them on tables and people can touch them. And you could see, like, all the archivists, because we had sort of three or four people from Prony in the meeting going, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, yeah, we could get workshops with tables. And we'll put everybody at different tables. And then we'll get people to go around. And one table could be, like, poor law records. And one table could be, you know, court records and all this kind of stuff. And you can see the archivists going, how could we ever control or manage, you know, that in a safe way, you know? And so that, that was really something that needed to be hacked out at the beginning um, and stuff. Because, um, and another issue which really kind of also was really preoccupying Prony far more than it was me, really, um, was the whole issue of reach. Okay, so we're going to get maybe 50 or 60 people in, but um, in the door and attending. But what about other people? And again, yeah. I mean, your issue really is about trying to get outside of Belfast, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, well, many issues about city impact um, and reach were both big issues for us. I mean, we already knew from experience about the importance of online presence. Our website currently gets over 11 million page views a year. Um, this year, we expect to hit 14 million, and that has um, grown year upon year upon year. Um, any news we post quickly circulates around certainly the Irish genealogical blogs and boards. Um, and for us, certainly, uh, traditionally, like many archival institutions, we would have gone out to family history centres or local family societies and spoken to about eight people, maybe ten people. What we wanted to get into was maximising technology, whereby we used our facilities in Titanic Quarter and were able to put it on online, and that's pretty much what we did. Yeah, and so, but you were really pushing me, which I didn't really want to do, to video the series. So you kept saying, how can we video this? How can we video this? And I'm like, yeah. You know, because that, again, and this is what, again, something else I'm sure that you've all encountered in your partnership projects that you've been involved in, is, is that it's the small thing that's going to make the whole project, like, fall over, like, at the knees, right? So the issue of who would video the lectures just became this massive obstacle. Yeah. 
Um, neither of us actually had a video camera um, <laughs> for a start. You know, and can I just sort of interject and say, yes, we, I am the Open University, you know, um, and uh, yes, we have been doing like distance visual learning <laughs> since the 1970s. Um, but the idea of me in Belfast trying to get access to, and I actually yeah. had a video camera in my regional office, but I didn't know how to use it. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, the actual solution we came was from an unexpected source in conversation with NI Direct. Has anybody heard of NI Direct? NI Direct is Northern Ireland's equivalent to DirectGov. Yay, we love DirectGov. Um, um, and, and in a bit of haggling, we discovered one of their web developers had a special interest in video and made his own films, science fiction films, science fiction films set in Bangor, Northern Ireland. Um, and he offered his own time to come and video them. Um, and not only did he offer to come and do it, but he, came and he offered to edit them as well. Um, so all that remained for us was to set up a YouTube channel and, and populate it. Um, yeah, and again, and that was something that would have been pretty much impossible for me to do within the confines of a university. So having Prony being able to do that was perfect. Um, but what then we did, we got the idea um, then to, um, to set up a blog that would go along with it. Because I kept thinking, well, I'm a complete charlatan because I'm not a local historian by training. And um, I would need to kind of cover this fact up in some way. Um, mainly by just admitting it from the off and then sort of and then s launching into like a local history project of my own that would accompany the series. So the idea being that if you came to each one of the lectures, you would hear a little bit more about my own project into the local town land that I had chosen. And so you can see here that within the university sector, within the Open University website, it wasn't too difficult to actually set up a blog um, and to start populating it, which is kind of what we did. Um, so um, I could chart my progress then um, and post lecture tips and pointers and some of the lecturers put their, um, let me put their PowerPoint presentations up here and all the rest of it and things. So, um, so it became like a little site for a while, right? And it's sort of one of my little unfinished projects um, that sort of sits there with the potential to kind of continue and to go on and become something else. Because of course we had other problems as well, you see. Yeah, I mean, if, if you build it, they may not come, is <laughs> probably the answer. Um, advertising was always a big um, gap. I mean, what more access do you have to advertising, Janice? Well, our marketing department only kind of looks at national campaigns and they don't actually believe that any sort of subject specific marketing actually works. So there was, so I have no budget, no marketing budget, no advertising budget, no publicity, no distribution lists, nothing. Yeah. So that basically fell all to Prony. As we had it reopened, we, for the first time ever, we actually got an advertising budget. Oh, we haven't had it since. <laughs> um, but we were able to take adverts out in the local press. And this was the first event that we launched under our own, our new brand of leafleting. It was the first time we started using the Prony distribution list for the for this explicit purpose of as a publicity vehicle. Um. Yes, um, because I couldn't believe it when Stephen said to me, I can do you 6,000 flyers, no problem. That would have been completely impossible for me to have actually delivered. And I think the advert in the Belfast Telegraph proved crucial. The number of people who said to us as the lecture series continued, oh, we, we heard about you from reading the paper. And I think it's quite interesting because, again, in our chase for social media or for online or getting it up on a website, we forget particularly that the adult market continues to rely on print-based sources of information for finding out about things. And that trying to maintain a presence, particularly in the local press, um, can be really, really vital um, uh, for that demographic. Okay, the first, day came, first evening came, all went pretty well, had about 100 people turn up on the first night. Later, the lectures obviously don't get the same numbers. Um, we had about 50. Technology worked. Um, we were named in the Independent earlier this year as one of the top 10 spring lecture series in the UK. Um, Prony YouTube channel proved much more popular than anticipated and has reached a four-figure audience for some of the videos. Um, we also realized there was a demand to continue the project. So, Year two, we moved from exploring local history to exploring urban history. And then this year, we're moving to exploring family history. Yeah, I mean, not everything went smoothly, as you can well imagine. And it's been very much a learning process. I mean, it took time to sort out the timings of the lectures. And um, we were probably a little over ambitious 
just, you know, at the beginning trying to cram too much in and making it a bit too long. And so I think we've, so, and we certainly tweaked it. I mean, I don't think the details are particularly exciting about that. So, um, and the whole issue of sources as well was yeah. something that was problematic. And certainly the display then of sources. Yeah, I mean, we tried lots of things. We tried overhead um, scanners to display material. We had the originals out on tables. Eventually fell to the trusted and tried handout. Um, the posting of the lectures on YouTube proved popular. Again, it proved difficult to support this element because um, I didn't have access to any direct cameraman for series two. Yeah. And while I had the camera, I didn't really know how to work it all that well. And so we just did the classic thing, which was, I'm chairing the session, I'm bringing the camera. The one time I forgot to charge the battery, and then the next time I thought the external mic was working. And so, I mean, this is really dumb stuff. And I'm sure if, you, some, if someone saw our leaflets and said, oh, this is an academic from a history department, you know, but she's actually videoing her own lecture, they just wouldn't have believed it, that we wouldn't have had the resources to be able to bring those together. And maybe we would have done... But again, my headquarters are in Milton Keynes, and so that's really hard for me to access resources from there and things. So we made all the classic mistakes. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, it was, comes down to... Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the prob constrictive rules is our respective institutions. And I say that not necessarily talking about Prony itself, but Prony is part of the a bigger department, and that department is bigger than their own civil service. It doesn't necessarily lend itself to doing things small scale. Yeah. Um, and even though these are large, and you, you, university, um, open universities similarly, even though these are big mammoth institutions, uh, actually summoning up small resources and getting access to them is prohibitively complex. Um, I can't just call up a cameraman, for instance, nor can I ask nor can I ask staff to work evenings, I have to persuade them, encourage them, offer them carrots. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so, so the lecture series has been, um, has been a real learning experience for us, um, and, uh, and I think that some of the things that we've learned and gained from it have been, um, I suppose, some of the keywords we've been hearing already, things like impact, so my profile has been raised substantially within the local heritage community, and I've gotten several other events as a result. Um, but what I think, um, uh, and the other thing, but what I think has kind of is clear is, is that if we want to develop this or make it bigger, we need money uh, and external funding, because it's clear that the successful projects we've been hearing about so far today have already have had their own internal funding structures and that you're only going to be able to get a project to run so far and so successfully on the goodwill of two people operating at the intersection of two organizations, really. Um, I think, though, that the, what's also interesting, too, is, is that we now both want to develop the project in new ways, right? A lecture series is all fine and well, but what can we do more, right? I mean, I know Stephen's got big ideas as well, but, you know, but my big idea is, is, that, is to try and develop this whole sort of the issue of skills development, for adults, that it's fine to lecture about content, but um, we really need to try and develop uh, skills if we're going to have long-term impact and long-term, you know, important community engagement. And I'm going to give the final word to him. Well, actually, my final word is yeah, up, so thank you, and then we get up to it. <laughs>